What do you call a cat that likes lemons? <clears throat> a sourpuss. Well done. What kind of bird can lift heavy objects? Oh, a swallow. What kind of bird can lift heavy objects? A crane. Well done. Oh, <laughs> you're so wise. Everyone's like, she is wise. <laughs> what, why do cheetah, why do not, why don't cheetahs like to take baths? Huh? Not cheetahs? Because they don't want to be spotless. All right, all right. I think the crane was the most favorite one, for sure. <clears throat> so this is where we're starting, and it's not a really great introduction because we kind of hit the pause button right middle through the lecture, okay? But we're talking now about global ischemia, global cerebral ischemia. And this situation happens when there's uh, kind of widespread uh, problems within, within the brain. Um, you've got a systolic pressure that's below 50 millimeters of mercury, right? That's the contractile phase of the heart cycle, all right? So what's systolic pressures typically? You guys know? Probably around 120. Okay. So when would you see systolic pressures below 50? When might that happen in a clinical situation? What's that? A blockage? Eh, not really. What's that? When you're in shock. And when, you're, when you've lost a lot of blood volume. Right? So trauma. And you're hemorrhaging. Or there's exsanguination that's taking place. And, and a lot of blood volume is being lost, and therefore blood pressure plummets, it drops. And so you can see from a clinical standpoint, we've got situations from a mild on the left side of the screen all the way over to severe, where we can have transient confusion, usually resulting into uh, complete recovery, or there might be widespread neuronal death, and the patient could end up permanently damaged, brain damaged, or a vegetative state, as we label it. So the brain cells themselves begin to die after four to six minutes of no blood flow. Okay, so five minutes, plus or minus one. That's all you can handle without having blood flow. So we've had, you know, there have been definitely reports of, of people that have died, and then they went through a tunnel, they saw the light, and then they came back, right? Usually that period of time is under six minutes. Otherwise, there's permanent brain damage, okay? Okay. So you could be pronounced dead um, medically, meaning the heart rate is done and there's no breathing, but brain activity might still go for another five to six minutes post no heartbeat and no respirations. Pretty crazy, huh? And, and so that, you know, that kind of explains some of these situations where people say, well, I was dead and then they brought me back, right? But... <clears throat> In about 10 seconds of no blood flow to the brain, you actually will lose consciousness. And that's a protective mechanism by the body. Okay, so if blood flow is compromised for 10 seconds and the brain's not getting, you shut down conscious activity. And you just operate the brain stem. That's also a protective mechanism. Number one is you minimize um, metab metabolic activity or metabolic demand. Number two, <clears throat> Usually you fall over, <laughs> right? So it's easier for the blood to get to the brain, even if the heartbeat is very low. Okay, so you go into a supine position or a horizontal position. Now, we talk about global ischemia with shock, okay, or severe hypotension is another way clinically to describe it. Uh, now let's contrast this with focal cerebral ischemia. This is a situation that you were talking about where there's a blockage. So this is typically due to an arterial occlusion where you've got uh, a blood vessel and there's a lesion inside of it and it's preventing distal blood flow. 
if blood is not flowing distally to the tissues within the brain, then you're going to uh, go through what's called focal ischemia. This can lead to an infarction. And an infarction of the brain is where you'd have a stroke. So this is a type of a cerebral vascular injury or a cerebral vascular incident uh, that would lead to a stroke. If you have an infarction, you're going to have a stroke. Now, strokes are not all created equal. The, the outcomes of stroke can be different depending upon the patient and what part of the brain was being affected. And if you go back to Monday, we spent a lot of time going over different regions and areas of the brain. And I always get this question, well, that was review material in 201, Dr. Keller. Is that testable material? What do you think the answer to that is? If we covered in lecture, it's game on. It's fair game. And I think the point, we didn't cover the entire brain area. You know, we, we, we honed in on a couple of key areas like motor and sensory cortex. We talked about the occipital lobe. We talked about Wernicke's and Broca's area. We didn't cover every area of the brain, but I wanted to give you an appreciation for if you have one of these focal ischemia areas or an infarction, and it's in that area that controls motor function of speech, then that's the stroke clinical sequela, or that's the stroke clinical outcome, is that the patient has difficulty forming speech. Okay. Now, <clears throat> The brain itself has a tremendous amount of redundancy. And I think I've said this at least once, if not twice before. In biological systems, if there's redundant mechanisms, redundant pathways, what does that usually tell you? If you're going to spend biological energy making something twice, what should that be a clue? It's probably important. So the brain is pretty important because it's got this redundant flow of the circle of Willis that comes up. And we talked about this. So the carotid vessels bifurcate into the internal and external carotids. And the internal goes up and forms this sort of crown that goes like this that forms the circle of Willis. And from there, you have all this branching that takes place and goes into different portions of the brain, the microvasculature of the brain. But those smaller diameter vessels are definitely at risk for thrombosis or embolism as we get older. So as we get older and the vessels become diseased or compromised, atherosclerotic disease is global. It's all over the entire body. And so those smaller diameter vessels get blocked. And as they get blocked, if it clots, then it, it forms a thrombus, which is a blood clot. If it narrows, and maybe a piece of the diseased portion of the atherosclerotic lesion breaks off and goes into the bloodstream. It goes downstream into an area that's partially narrowed, and it gets stuck. That's called an embolism. Okay? Those are the differences. Sure. So with occlusions in the middle of a blood vessel, I'll do one better. I'll actually draw that diagram again because I, I think it might be helpful. Oop, not with a Sharpie. That would be bad. Well, I wouldn't have to draw it again, that's for sure. Okay. <coughs> so let's take our blood vessel, okay? So if over time, over we a as we age, let's say that this thing gets narrowed because in this area, it's diseased. Okay? And, and this is an athroma. So now we would say that this vessel might be um, maybe 50% patent or 50% open. Well, if the disease continues and the blood clots within that lumen, that opening, and blocks it off, that's called a thrombus. If the disease is upstream and part of the thrombus breaks off and moves distally and gets trapped here because it's too big, that would be considered an embolus. You understand the difference? So 
what's the who cares? What are we talking about? Well, we're actually talking about stroke or mini strokes or pre-stroke or what we call transient ischemic attacks, TIAs. So a transient ischemic attack, it's just like the word uh, or, or the language implies. Transient means it's temporal, it's temporary. It, it, it comes on and then it goes away. So patients that have a TIA, they have stroke-like symptoms, but they get better. It goes away. You're like, well, what, what, what happened there? Well, there was a moment of temporary blood reduction or a loss of blood flow, and then those areas, those neural centers were compromised. Blood flow resumed, and it came back. Okay? But kind of like your car, right? If that check engine light comes on, and you look at it, you're like, oh, crap. But then it goes off, and you're like, oh, sweet. Must be fine, right? Are you fine? Nine times out of ten, if it goes on, but it goes off, are you fine? You think so? <laughs> Let's say it comes on every time you start your car, but it goes off while you're driving. Good? Yeah, good. What if it's on, but you put a sticker over it so you can't see it. Good to go. Solid. Don't worry about it. So usually these are a warning sign, okay? If, if they're happening in patients, they're, they're often predictive for future strokes, and that's what goes in the line, okay? So the answer to the check engine light analogy is go to AutoZone and have them read the code. It's for free. It'll tell you if you're good or if you're not, right? Okay? Um, and that's not like, you know, that's not like a commercial for AutoZone. I think, I think uh, O'Reilly does the same thing. You know, most mechanics will read them for free. Um, so transient ischemic attacks, there's a temporary loss of blood flow, but it comes back. So let's take a look at this radiograph. That's a fancy word for an x-ray. So this is at the carotid bifurcation. So the head is up here. This is the neck, right? And the heart would be down here. This is the common carotid at the very bottom. It bifurcates into the internal and external. And this is uh, injected with a radio-opaque dye, so like a barium sulfate. It's a, it's a solution that when you hit it with x-ray, um, it's radio-opaque. So it, it'll show up on x-ray, OK? And so what you can appreciate is the black filling is where the dye is actually filling the entire vessel lumen. You guys with me? So as if from this wall to this wall is being filled with the dye. Now look to the image on your right, and you can appreciate that there is a narrowing, or what we call a necking, of the vessel lumen, and that's indicative of there's, there's a lesion. And so if you get an arteriogram where they inject this dye and they take a picture, and you see narrowing, they might say, well, you know, we're a little nervous for grandpa because we had a TIA. He came in to get his check engine light looked at, we did an arteriogram of the neck, and we're seeing that there is definitely disease in the vessels. And they say, you know, we want to we wanna replace your spark plugs, right? It's time to intervene and go fix that. Okay? So about a third of all TIA patients later experience a stroke. So it's not nine times out of ten. It's about 33.3%, right? One out of three patients that have TIAs later move on to have a stroke. Some of the symptoms, that could be weakness in the arms or the legs or the face. There could be, it could be on one side only. There might be a droopiness to the face um, if it's motor control of the left side because there was an ischemic injury on the motor cortex on the right that controls the left facial muscles. Um, there could be droopy eyes, there could be blurred vision, um, troubled hearing, uh, seeing stars, Right, if you're seeing stars, where was the TIA? Occipital lobe, okay? Uh, difficulty walking, dizziness, loss of balance, <clears throat> loss of coordination. These are all things that can be TIAs.
Yeah, that's what's happening here. That's a, that's a plaque. That's an arthroma. So you're not good, even if it resolves. You should go get looked at. And I'm going to tell you here in a couple slides what we, what we can do about it, okay? Um, if you don't treat it and it goes on to stroke, it can end up in an infarction, which would be a stroke, another name for a stroke, cerebral infarction. So this is neural tissue, a cerebral infarct, upper left. I want you to, it looks like this was some photograph and someone laid a glass of water, and this is the water stain. This is the scar right here of the infarct. This is normal neural tissue on the edges, and you can kind of see this gliosis border. Okay? That's what a cerebral infarct looks like. If we zoom into this area, so right about here is this picture, and what you're seeing, in, and it's panel C that's on the far upper right, um, but there's an infiltration by uh, neutrophils. So we have the beginning of our inflammatory response. Neutrophils are coming in. And <clears throat> then in panel D, we've got the microglial cells, which are our macrophage cells of the neural tissue that are moving in to try to clean up the debris. This is about 10 days later. And then over on the far right, uh, lower right, is gliosis. And you can kind of, uh, hopefully what you can appreciate is this collagen that's deposited here has a very different architecture than anything else around it. And so this is a neural scar or a gliosis. So this panel, we could be looking at skin tissue, right? But we're looking at a stroke patient. And we're looking at what happens sequentially with this healing response. And it's got all the same hallmarks that we've already learned about, right? I kind of told you in the beginning of the semester when we kind of got to inflammation, I said, hey, this is one of my favorite topics because the inflammatory process, if you know that, you have such a tool to translate so many different types of diseases. You will really understand a lot of the progressions in many of the diseases that you're going to come across as you study or as you go out professionally because inflammation is such a, a critical component of it, and it's no different with stroke. So what can we do about it, kind of to Max's point? Well, in that patient, at the minimum, what we might say is, you know, you've got some narrowing. Maybe this number isn't 50% reduced or 50% open. Maybe it's you got a 25% reduction. So you're 75% open. But you know what? Um, we want to watch it, and we don't want to do surgery because there's risks associated with surgery. So we're going to intervene pharmaceutically, and we're going to give you what we call an antiplatelet regime. So I'm going to put you on medications. It's referred to as a blood thinner in some cases. Um, so some examples here, like aspirin. A lot of older patients take an aspirin a day. It, it minimizes the thrombotic events that can take place because a aspirin has a natural anticoagulant uh, function to it. So an aspirin a day for your grandparents, that's one of the reasons they're taking it is they know there's global atherosclerosis, and so they're just trying to reduce the opportunity that you might have a thrombotic event in one of these diseased vessels that isn't as clean as it used to be when they were younger, okay? Um, some stronger medications other than aspirin, Plavix uh, or Persantine, these are other types of antiplatelet therapies that are pills, pharmaceuticals that you take. Okay? That's not that big of a deal. If you had a TIA and you could take an aspirin or you could take a pill a day and reduce your risk of having a stroke, I would do that, right? Wouldn't you? Question. Yeah, so the question is, um, well, is there problems associated with taking antiplatelet therapy on a daily basis? Absolutely. There's going to be certain things that you want to be careful about, um, but it's far better than having a lethal stroke. You know, the chances of you cutting yourself and you bleeding out and not being able to stop uh, are pretty low in comparison to the chances of having a stroke. You have about a 33% chance of having a stroke that will kill you. Um, for you to, you know, be slicing carrots and miss, you can go to the ER and, you know, 
They could tourniquet, you know, if they needed to, they could sew it up. So yes, you have some risks associated and you'll see that with patients. There are certain activities that they're restricted from doing. Um, you, don't want, you don't want to be doing those types of things because you could, you could bleed out, you could. Was that a question or just a hair adjustment? Okay, hair adjustment, gotcha, okay. Um, <clears throat> secondly now, so we can do surgery on these patients. Uh, we can come in and we can do an endarectomy where we open up the neck, uh, but that surgery is kind of archaic now. We don't do that much anymore. Um, so what they would do is they would go in, they would open up the neck, um, they would isolate the vessel, they would put vessel loops, they would clamp it off, um, and they, you know, so it doesn't bleed when they cut out the disease section. They take out the disease section and they put a replacement vessel in place and sew it in. Okay, that's an open repair. It's not really done much anymore because what we can do now is endovascular approaches. This is what's shown here on the bottom right. Here's another picture of what we're talking about, normal carotid vessel pair, and here's our diseased vessel. The yellow is the lumen, and you can see that there's a disease here um, that is causing uh, a significant reduction, about you know 95% um, diseased. So the endovascular repair, and then I'll get to your question, is you bring a catheter. Usually you access the catheter through one of the leg vessels, like a femoral artery. And there's a wire, a very bendy wire that goes up, and the wire is visible under um, fluoroscopy or x-ray. So you can literally watch the wire on a TV screen, go up, and you can follow it up. It, it gets into position. And then over the wire, you insert a catheter. And the catheter has loaded on it a crushed stent. It's crushed down on, on the catheter. And um, it's crushed down on the catheter on top of typically a balloon. And you put it through the disease section, and then down here on the, on the, on the surgical table uh, on the cath, in the cath lab, um, you inflate the balloon with saline, not with air, because if the balloon pops, you put air in the vessel. You inflate it with saline, uh, and that pushes and expands the stent. The stent moves the disease out of the way. You deflate the balloon. It shrinks down, and you remove it, and then you basically sew up in the growing where you access the femoral artery you know, maybe a little bit of an incision that's about an inch or two and a half centimeters long, okay? That's endovascular repair. I know I have a couple questions. Let me just finish a couple thoughts, and then we'll get, uh, get to that. So a couple different variations or flavors of the stent, okay? So you can see here's the disease. You guys can appreciate the necking down. This is after the stent has been placed. Can you see the stent under x-ray? Yeah, because it's made out of metal. Okay, many of them are nitinol or a nickel titanium. They might be a stainless steel. You can see them on x-ray, okay? Now, that was a balloon expandable stent that I just talked about. There are what we call self-expanding stents, where they're not crushed on a wire. They actually are a metal, like a nitinol, that has a memory, and then when they crush them down um, and then they uh, secure them, if you deploy them or release the secure um, trigger, they'll go into their nominal diameter. That's a self-expanding self stent. Third variety, and then we'll get to questions, drug-eluting stents. So nowadays, we have more sophisticated stents that have impregnated into them uh, drugs that will, will be released in the area of the disease. Okay? And we're, we're, this is flashing forward to when we talked about the cardiovascular section. What's going on in this atheroma is there's a lot of proliferation of cells that you don't want to proliferate. And so a lot of the drugs that are impregnated into the drug-eluting stents are anti-proliferatives. Okay, they, they release a local drug, so you don't have to take a pill, and they last for five years. Now, the five-year date on drug-eluting stents is not that great. Not that great over non-eluting stents, but there was a lot of buzz in the industry when they first came on, okay? And they're still out there. Okay, okay question question, and I think there was one in the back. Preventative measures, could you do it? Yeah, yeah, of course. Endothelium, endothelial cells.
Yeah, so save that thought for when we get to the cardiovascular section because we'll talk about cholesterol balancing. Um, so there's two types of cholesterols, right, HDL and LDL. And, um, and one of them, the HDL, actually encourages fat to be removed from the blood and deposited into the liver. And LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, takes fat out of the liver and makes it available in the bloodstream. And so, yes, the, the question was, are there things you can do preventatively? Yeah, you can. You can eat healthy. You can watch your cholesterol intake. Uh, you can, you know, manage your numbers, you know. And, of course, there's cholesterol-lowering medications, a lot like a Lipitor that a lot of patients are on. These are all preventative measures. You can exercise. Don't smoke. I mean, that's kind of a big one, okay? Um, and... Um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about vaping. Some of you are already curious about that. We'll wait till the rest. The respiratory section, we might have trouble getting through <laughs> now with the coronavirus because i got to work that into the lecture now. Um, but um, we've got a lot of that information coming. Yeah, you can. But at the end of the day, um, much of your vascular health is coded by your DNA, right? Your DNA, sorry. So your DNA codes most of your vascular <laughs> I promised my kids I would say it that way, so that's for you guys. Um, <clears throat> so in our DNA, most of our vascular health is coded, okay? And so you'll see some really, really health-conscious people as they get older will have vascular issues, and you're like, what, what's happening there, okay? So some of it you just can't get away from. And cancer's the same way. Yeah, you can't, you can't escape your genes, okay? Question here. Ah, how long do they last? Do they have to be replaced? That's a great question. So they are permanent stents as of now. Um, they have about a five to 10 year lifespan in vivo, meaning that the clinical follow-up data is pretty good out to five and maybe 10 years in some cases. So then what do you do? Well, you go in and you revise. So you can actually deploy another stent within a stent. So uh, migrations, the question is, do the stents ever, yeah, they can, they, they do. These are all adverse events associated with uh, medical device deployment. Um, and, and so if it's deployed, maybe it's not deployed in the right spot or it's, it's not appropriately sized or it's used for the wrong um, kind of disease, then there's two types of, um, getting a little bit into the weeds, but that's okay because you're interested. There's two types of fixations. There's first type of fixation is called uh, passive fixation, and that just means that you put a diameter stent in a vessel that's smaller. And so it expands, and it basically has a radial force that's pushing up against the walls of the blood vessel. That's called passive fixation. Then there's a second type of fixation, which is called active. And active fixation, these stents, let's say there's a stent in here. These stents have these little barbs that actually stick into the vessel wall these anchors, and they actually are perforating the vessel wall to some level, okay, which leads to another issue. In some cases, there's been stent perforations where they come through. So I prefer passive fixation over active if I had to choose. If I was a patient and you had a stent to choose from, I would go with passive fixation. It's a little gentler on the vessel. No, they never ask you that question. You have to be an, your own best advocate. I think in the future, you guys ready for this? I think we should invent a whole new field of medicine. You ready? Patient advocates. You go to med school, you go to PA school, and you literally get hired to be the patient advocate, to ask those questions. Because they don't, they don't ask you that. They don't take the time to tell you, which one would you prefer? Would you like the passive or the active today? Right? It's like, uh, what's the difference, right? What's the cost difference? Do you offer both, right? How long will they last? So, no, they don't, they usually don't have, they don't tell you this information. Well, they may, they may, they may inform them. So there's all sorts of things as to why they wouldn't inform. Maybe that hospital only buys active fixation devices, right? That, that's a thing. Yeah. So you might have to choose another hospital, right? Patient advocate. It's a thing, man. Let's start it. You heard it here first. Okay, in the back and then up front. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the question is, has there been cases where maybe the disease overpowers the stent, where the, the plaque buildup continues? Yeah, that's absolutely the case, and usually about the five to 10 year window is when that happens, even if it's coated with a drug. That's why I was saying the drug, the drug eluding stents, the, the, there was all this la, you know, luster of, oh, we're gonna get out to 10 year data that's amazing with drug eluding stents. And the five year data came in and it was about the same as non drug eluding stents. So at about the five to 10 year window, you're gonna have to have replaced or revised, I should say. So that almost happens all the time. Your question happens almost all the time. What's that? Yeah, they'll come in and redo it, revise it. Yep, another stent in. Now, you always have the surgery option available. And so when you have a stent and you need to have it revised and you go back in with another stent, if it doesn't work, you can always go in for surgery as long as you're surgically eligible. You're a surgical candidate. You know, you're not too old or too sick. You can handle anesthesia. Anesthesia is kind of rough. Some up front? Yeah, <clears throat> great question. So uh, from the pictures, you can see that, you know, the artery is kind of bulging when you put the stent in. And so, yeah, that's diseased tissue. So you have to be careful about that. There is a limit, um, especially with the passive fixation devices, because you're putting pressure on the vessel wall. If the vessel wall is diseased, you have the danger of causing a tear. And so you don't want to do that. So you actually you have to be mindful about that. Okay. All right, we got to move on. I'd be happy to entertain your questions like after class if you've got some other ones, okay? Great questions, you guys. All right, shifting gears a little bit. Let's talk about trauma to the brain. So these are vascular-related issues. You could have a hemorrhage. You could have a shock. You could be bleeding out. Your systolic pressure could drop. That would be global ischemia. You could have a focal disease. That could be an infarct or a stroke. It could be a TIA first, and then it moves on to stroke because you ignore the warning signs, or maybe you get on a persantine or an antiplatelet therapy uh, and you control your diet, but your genes are just gonna tell you, uh, we're gonna have this happen, and it's just a matter of time. Now, this is different. This is actually trauma. So now we're kind of moving into this portion of the lecture where we're talking about injury to the brain, whether it's a blunt force trauma or an open trauma. So if it's blunt force trauma, like the, the, the skull cap is actually intact, okay? So that would be like a lot of accidents. Open trauma could be if the skull gets compromised, like it's fractured, and now either you have bone particulates going into neural tissue or you just have, you know, other things that can access the brain tissue because the, the cranial cap is compromised. But one thing in this picture that I want to highlight is this coup contra coup injury. So the Coup injury refers to if you're, let's say it's a motor, uh, a motor vehicle accident, okay? And the patient hits the, the dashboard. So the brain strikes the inside of the skull, right? And, and there's an injury here. Well, there's a recoil that happens and the brain actually moves backwards. So there's a contra coup injury on the back part of the, of the brain because of the recoil that takes place. And both of those injuries can be problematic. Both of those injuries pr could be problematic. Um, and on autopsy, if the patient you know, didn't make it, you should be able to determine which one was which. Because you'll see kind of the first strike as being the bigger injury and then the contra coup injury being secondary. Question. No, whiplash is referring to um, uh, what happens with the um, musculoskeletal system at the, at the level of the neck, like the cervical vertebrae. So it could be a coup contra coup injury to the brain itself, but on the musculoskeletal side, you're probably having like disc injury or, or you're having um, articulations that get disrupted within the vertebrae of the neck. Okay, that's what whiplash is really referring to. Okay. So this is a, a case study. There was a student that did um, an internship with the medical examiner's office <coughs> here in um, Coconino County and did it as field work and did an independent study where I was the professor and, and the medical examiner was, um, was obviously the supervisor. And so this is a real case that I wanted to uh, share with you guys. Um, 
20-year-old Caucasian female tourist on an un unprescribed Zoloft, so it's an antidepressant, presents dizzy and fell on the back of her head. She expired on the way to the emergency department with possible pre-death seizure activity, and the question rises as to the cause of death, brain trauma, or seizure. Okay. So in this particular case, this actually happened um, uh, at one of the, the like the turn, uh, hairpin turns on the way from Fien uh, Flagstaff to Sedona down Oak Creek Canyon, that 89A. And they, they had pulled off there to kind of look at, uh, at the views, and she got dizzy and fell and hit her head. And so the question is, was it a seizure that caused the issue, or was it the impact that caused the issue? Okay? Uh, so <clears throat> here's the results. At autopsy, she didn't make it. Um, significant occipital lobe trauma, possible hemorrhage and induced hematoma, and a contracu trauma to the frontal lobe. Cause of death determined to be brain trauma induced death. So she fell and hit the pavement, and the strike to the head killed her. Okay. Um, probably was dizzy because she was on her boyfriend Zoloft. That's what we learned later. Um, so that's one of the reasons, you know, she was small, uh, petite. Yeah, she was probably taking too much of a dose as an antidepressant or maybe too frequently, but she was borrowing the medication, um, and that causes dizziness, and she just literally fell and hit her head, okay? Um, so just an example, uh, a real-world example of how this information would be used um, on the hemorrhaging that we're about to get into and hematoma and coup contra coup injury. Okay. But before we go to that, <clears throat> let's talk about diffuse versus focal injury. So diffuse versus focal. Focal is kind of what we were alluding to. This one is uh, contusions, concussions, hematomas, and hemorrhages. Those are focal. Uh, they're localized. They're in certain areas, like this uh, unfortunate young lady tourist that fell. This would have been a focal lesion. You know, she struck the back of, her, back of her head when she fell, and it, she hit with such force on the back of her head that the contra coup injury defied gravity and went up and struck the frontal lobe. Did you guys catch that part? So she fell this way, and the brain struck this here and then basically bounced off the back of the skull and struck the frontal lobe. That was the contra coup injury. That's a pretty hard fall. Okay. So these are all focal. Contusions, concussions, hematomas, and hemorrhage. Diffuse axonal injury, <coughs> DAI, um, this one refers to um, stuff that can happen in the absence of blunt force trauma. So this could actually be um, acceleration forces or forces that take place um, when there's rotation that's happening. And so the best example that I can, I can explain here, which is hard to talk about, but um, you guys have heard of the shaken baby syndrome. So shaking baby syndrome, unfortunately, is an example of a type of diffuse axonal injury <clears throat> where early in development, these infants, uh, maybe they're, not, they're, not, they're crying too much, and so a, a parent that you know, could be um, uh, postpartum depression, but it, it could be either the mom or the dad, and uh, they're, they're, they're sleep-deprived, they don't know what to do, and you know, they just kind of you know, are like, trying to console the kid, and unfortunately, they overly aggressively shake the kid to try to just get their attention. And what that does is it can actually cause rotational trauma to the neuron. And what you can see, this is a healthy neuron, but especially with young developing neurons, um, that twisting motion can actually damage the neuron itself, and it will die. And so in these diffuse axonal injury cases, um, you'll see this widespread throughout the brain. It's not a focal area like, like they got hit, okay? So uh, on investigative work, you know, cause of death for a, a, a baby, uh, want to know if they were struck or hit. Was, was that the abuse or was it, you know, diffuse? That's what they would be looking for on autopsy, okay? Horrible topic, but just giving you an example of the different types of um, diseases. So let's migrate into um, the focal stuff, the focal stuff. So concussion, uh, con concussions, contusions, hematomas, and hemorrhage. 
So we're going to talk about concussions as it relates to um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy here in a little bit, CTEs. But <clears throat> what is a co concussion? A concussion is simply described as a reverse altered consciousness. Okay, it's, it, it's reversible. Uh, it's different than it was, but it comes back. Um, there's no contusion, meaning there's no laceration or damage to the parenchymal tissue of the brain or the brain tissue itself. There's oftentimes a temporary loss of memory or amnesia. Uh, there is uh, an unknown pathogenesis. We just don't understand why this happens. The, the most widely accepted thought process on a concussion is that you've struck the neuron and you've disrupted action potentials from being fired. So they're in sort of a refractory period of time as they become reset. Okay, and I think I asked this, how many, how many have ever had a concussion? Okay, a few of you, actually, let's say bigger, higher raise. Yeah, that's quite, it's quite a number. Okay, they're relatively common if you play sports or if you're somewhat active, okay? Um, but again, the important thing is it's reversible. It's not as big of a deal. We'll talk about CTE here in a, in a little bit. It's not as big of a deal as long as it's kind of a one and done, okay? Uh, you have two, they get a little bit more nervous about it, okay? And if you're playing sports where you're having multi multiple concussions, um, then we start getting into the concern of uh, CTE, and I'll talk about that. And that usually is presenting itself these days in um, pugilists or boxers or fighters, um, and then secondarily in football players. And actually, it was, it was first described, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, in boxers, um, but, but um, it was more officially documented with histological evidence in um, uh, professional football players here in America. Okay, well, we'll talk about that here in a second. Yeah. One? Yeah. They're not a good thing. What's that? Oh, well, that's kind of a business decision, isn't it? <laughs> um, I mean, the question was how many concussions are, are considered um, a concern? I would say concussions in general are not not a good idea. So I have two soccer players, one's 17 and one's 10, and they've both had concussions already, mul multiple. Um, and, and so um, now they wear, like, they play soccer and they wear headbands. They wear, like, these impact headbands that I found. Um, and they do a pretty good job, but they're not, they're, you know, they're not bulletproof. I mean, I've threatened to send them out there in football helmets, but their coaches said that's a bad idea. So... Um, so what you worry about with, you know, like I take the, this is an extreme situation, but this is one of those things where, like, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it suck to be, you know, me to be your dad? Because I'd be worried about everything, right? You know, just enough to be paranoid about everything, but not enough to know all the answers, right? It's a really dangerous place to be. Um, and now we've got the internet where you can just Google anything and be like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, you know. <laughs> Let's wrap them in bubble wrap. Um, so when... You know, you take that tourist that fell. I mean, that was just one incident. You know, fell on pavement, okay, and probably completely passed out. And uh, but I, but my oldest, um, her most recent concussion was at a away game, out in the White Mountains. It was like three and a half hours away, and my wife and I weren't around. We weren't. We didn't go to that game, and uh, she lost consciousness. Um, you know, went up for went up for the ball, and and two defenders kind of crushed her. And uh, she blacked out, and on the way down, she hit one of their knees. Um, and, um, you know, so you just worry about that stuff. It, we, what you worry about is a brain bleed. So let, let, me, let, me, let me show you what, 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 what I worry about, okay? <laughs> let me show you the slides that I try to show my wife, but she says she will not have it. So a contusion is what you really worry about, right? This is where you have damage to the parenchymal tissue, where the, the brain tissue itself has a laceration. And so if the, if the injury is that aggressive, and one of, one of your colleagues and I were talking after class last week about Runa, about the swelling that took place in the brain, and, it, and, and he was actually really disturbed about it, and I haven't stopped thinking about it since. Um, but one of the questions that he posed is, was there any damage to the brain tissue itself, like lacerations, with that much pressure? Well, it, it happened slowly, and the brain was accommodating. It was... It was plastic enough to stretch. Here, it's right away, so the brain doesn't accommodate. So you get tearing, you get perforations, right? You get bruising, and then you lead to necrosis. 
Um, and so what you can see in this picture um, of this patient, uh, there's multiple contusions all over. So there's contusions here and bleeding, contusions here, uh, contusions over here. Oftentimes with a, with a, con, con, uh, a contusion, you're going to see blood. You're going to see areas of bruising, which is just um, blood leaving the vascular supply. Now, you could have a hematoma um, where you disrupt the vessel and it leads to uh, a bleed that clots off. So a hematoma is a local accumulation of blood. Okay? It, it's basically a bruise. When you ever, you know, let's say you ever had a Charlie horse and you look at your leg and now all of a sudden it's black and blue and then it turns all sorts of really pretty colors like yellow and oranges. Well, the reason that it turns colored is black and blue initially because that's clotted blood. So the, the bruise is, is blood has left the vascular supply because you ruptured vessels. So that's a pretty big deal. If that happens in the brain, it can be a big problem, okay? Now, you could have either an epidural or a subdural or a subarachnoid hematoma, and they have different implications associated with them. So if you look at this upper right picture, uh, this is our superior uh, sagittal sinus, and an epidural hematoma is described on the left side, and a subdermal hematoma is described on the right side. The difference basically is the type of blood. Epidural is usually arterial blood, and a subdermal uh, hematoma is venous blood. Okay, so the the arterial blood is going to have more of a reddish tone to it, and the subdural hematoma is going to have a little bit more of a bluish or purple tone to it. Okay, and then the subarachnoid. The subarachnoid hemorrhage is shown here where you've got bleeding in the subarachnoid space. And you would know it's a subarachnoid hematoma because you could actually do a CSF sample and you would see red blood cells in the CSF. That's how you would determine where it was, okay, definitively. Um, last category is a hemorrhage, which is basically an active bleed. And then some of you are going to ask me, like, these seem to overlap, and they do. <clears throat> they do. If you have a cerebral hemorrhage, which is an active bleed, once the bleeding stops, now what do you have? A hematoma. <laughs> okay? Could you have a concussion where there was a laceration, where there was a contusion that ruptured a vessel so there's a hemorrhage, and then later on after it heals, it's a hematoma? Yes. I just covered all four of them in one case, and that's what I worry about with soccer players. So, yeah, a concussion could actually be all four of these, babe, right? So put the helmet on, right? I'm the dad on the field, like, or on the sideline. Where's your headband, right? Like, she's like, oh, dad, whatever, you know. All right, so vessel rupture. <clears throat> but there's all sorts of types of complications that can lead to vessel rupture. It's not just playing soccer, okay? <clears throat> um, but I will tell you, in female sports, the number one... Um, the sport that has the number one concussions for females is actually soccer, okay? And obviously boxing and football is number one for guys, okay? Um, vessel rupture, the causes, hypertension, high blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure, it's everywhere. And so if you have high blood pressure and you have a weak vessel in the brain, there's an opportunity where you're going to get breakage of the of of the vascular supply, and you're going to get an active bleed, okay? Uh, arteriovenous malformations. So this is a picture of the circle of Willis right here. And you're, you're looking at all the different connecting arteries. So this comes in the basal artery. Um, it, it goes to the right on the posterior communicating, uh, and then over here to the anterior communicating, anterior cerebral, uh, and then it comes to the posterior uh, cerebral. And you can appreciate the internal carotids perfuse here and then distribute the vessel, uh, the blood flow out. Well, there are areas, and you can see these percentages, these are the areas where there are often common aneurysms that form in the brain. And, and it's because you've got sort of a weak spot genetically, and if it's a hypertensive situation, you might end up getting this um, aneurysm, which is a high pressure in a weak 
vessel wall and you get a bulging balloon that comes out. If it's a, um, looks like a sac, it's called a saccular aneurysm, that means it's asymmetric. Um, if it's um, sort of uniform, then we call that fusiform. So a saccular aneurysm is one where it kind of does this. A fusiform aneurysm is one where it does this. Does that make sense? Now, <clears throat> this picture on the lower right, this is a picture right here of a saccular aneurysm, which are more common than the fusiform. The saccular aneurysm that's occurring right here, this is the normal vessel coming in, here's a normal vessel coming in, and this is the bulge of this saccular aneurysm. So if it ruptures, it causes uh, an active hemorrhage, but once it's done, you end up with a hematoma or a pool of clotted blood. Some other pictures, this is that picture in higher magnification view uh, of that saccular aneurysm. Here histologically is a saccular aneurysm right here. So just to orient you, um, this is the vessel coming in and then the vessel leaving right here. So the inflow and then the exit. And this is the blowout of that aneurysm. Here's another histology. This is the inflow right here. Here is the outflow. And this is the aneurysm. You can see a little bit of clotted blood in the tip of that aneurysm. Okay. Question. Focal, they're focal. Focal cerebral damage. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so, so the question on these focal traumatic lesions, concussion, contusion, uh, hematoma, and hemorrhage. So the more aggressive the force of the trauma to the head, the more likely you're going to have more severe issues. The more severe issues are going to be an active bleed or pooling of blood or laceration. A concussion is reversible and you can recover, but the point that I'm trying to make is if you have multiple concussions, you're increasing your chance of having one of the other three happen. Okay? And what we're learning, and again, I'm, I keep foreshadowing to CTE, what we're learning is um, multiple concussions that can happen over time have longer term implications as well. Focal brain injury. Okay. Okay. Talk about a couple of other categories as we finish things out for today. So meningitis. Meningitis uh, every year is a, actually a pretty big deal. Uh, we've actually had some issues on this campus um, in years past, not, not recently. But this is an infection of the leptomeninges. And the leptomeninges, just to remind you, are the space that's occupied collectively by the pia and the arachnoid mater. And <clears throat> the problem or the etiological agents um, can either be bacterial, fungal, or viral. There's three different types. The symptoms are typically flu-like symptoms. It's like a stiff neck. Um, kind of feverish, um, patient becomes maybe a little irritable, their personality might switch a little bit because they're a little grumpy, um, uh, headaches, severe headaches, uh, photophobia or a fear of light or, or light bothers them, it gives, makes the headache worse. <clears throat> um, this picture that you see here is at the base of the skull and this white pus is indicative of a bacterial infection within the meningeal layers. And so this is a picture of active meningitis. Now, there's two different main types of bacterial infections. Um, one is the streptococcus pneumonia, and the other one is the Neisseria meningitis. So the streptococcus 
pneumonia, that first one that's listed there, um, that one typically affects this age group in the room, college age students. Okay. We often see streptococcus pneumonia happen not only on college campuses like in dorms, but we also see it in military barracks where you often have very close housing of individuals that takes place. Neisseria meningitis, this bacteria tends to affect uh, our pediatric and our geriatric population, our very young and our very old. Now, of course, depending upon um, what it is, uh, and, and a spinal tap will confirm that. So they'll, they'll pull cerebral spinal fluid and they'll test it. And if it cultures out bacteria, then they prescribe an antibiotic. Now, the antibiotic actually has to be delivered into, like, intrathecally into the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, if it's viral, then they have to treat it with an antiviral. And if it's a fungus, they have to treat it with an antifungal. It's very important. Um, meningitis is very treatable. It can be very scary if it's untreated, and it can lead to death uh, rather quickly. But um, if it's discovered and, and treatment is instituted, it's extremely um, treatable. Crutzfeld Jakob is a different case. Crutzfeld Jakob or CJD. Uh, Crutzfeld Jakob disease um, was popularized. I don't know, not, not the disease has become popular, but I would argue that coronavirus is an extremely popular disease, right? I mean, everybody's talking about it. I mean, the stock market can't ignore it for crying out loud. I wish it would stop. In the media, I wish they would stop, but the media is doing what the media does best, okay? Crutzfeld Jakob disease is also referred to as mad cow disease. So Crutzfeld Jakob disease is a prion based problem. Prions are um, normal proteins, okay? Normal proteins that um, um, can mutate. And in, in neural tissue, these, these proteins, if they mutate, and you can kind of see here we've got um, a normal prion or a peptide sequence, and, and at some point in time, there is a sporadic mutation that takes place, a conformational change in the protein, which makes it a mutable prion, and now it actually aggregates. And as it aggregates in the brain, and these are two different histology pictures, this picture right here is an, is an immunohistochemistry picture, which is staining the mutated prions with a brown label. And so you're getting these brown punctate stains in neural tissue in the brain of where the Crutzfeld Jakob disease is. Okay? A mutated protein, neural protein. Well, over time, this is a hematoxylin niacin stain, these aggregates rearrange, and they rearrange to create these vacuoles or these holes, spaces. Here's an inset right here, and you can see a blow up of one of the vacuoles or the holes. So literally, as the disease progresses, the neural tissue becomes spongy form. It gets these holes in it. Now, when that happens in critical areas in the brain, you get altered personality. You with me? And, and you can die from this. So um, it, it, it's more popularized in, in Europe. Um, in, in the 80s and then in the 2000s when they had an outbreak of mad cow disease. And um, the most common way to, to get Crutzfeld Jakob disease is actually uh, through eating contaminated meat. Okay. Uh, but it can happen independently. So there's an opportunity for a mutation that can take place to create this abnormal prion. It's about one case per million. Okay, one case per million is actually because of a spontaneous mutation. It's actually very, very rare. But the widespread issue has been eating contaminated meat. Bless you. So let me explain. So in bovine, it's called bone, bovine spongy form encephalopathy, otherwise known as mad cow disease. This disease happens in cows. And the cow's behavior is now they start acting crazy or mad. So that's why they call it mad cow disease. So the problem is, if you have contaminated cattle, and because of the meat processing industry, 
it's not super clean all the time, especially outside the United States. There's the opportunity for infected neural tissue to end up in the ground beef or the, to, the, to the meat that the humans are eating. Does that make sense? And so that's how it'll cross from cow over to human. That's the most common way it crosses. We have not, to my knowledge, had a, a creutzfeldt jakob disease patient in the United States ever. It's happened in Australia. It's happened in the UK, um, I think in Brazil, um, a lot of other places that have beef, but it's never happened here, okay? Um, <clears throat> next one, MS. This is a demyelinating autoimmune disease. The oligodendrocytes are the main problem. Remind me, what do oligodendrocytes do? They, they manufacture the myelin. Very good. Are they a glial cell in the central nervous system or in the peripheral nervous system? In the CNS. Very good. Okay. So you create a hypersensitivity to your oligodendrocytes and the myelin sheath. And you can see from this picture up here, we've got CD4 helper T cells involved that recruit macrophages. And we have CD8 positive T cells, which actually directly go and cause cytolysis of the oligodendrocytes that are manufacturing the myelin. Okay. So what ends up happening is you end up getting plaques. So this is a slice of the brain in a patient postmortem in this region that I'm circling that's kind of a reddish color uh, next to the lateral ventricle is a huge plaque. So it's a lesion due to this autoimmune response where you're destroying and leaving scar tissue behind. It's a type 4 hypersensitivity, as we talked about previously. Uh, women are twice as likely to uh, develop it as men. Uh, the case is about, the incidence is about one per thousand people in the United States. It is a uh, progressive disease where there's a steady decline in function over time. Um, and, and a lot of times the symptoms are episodic. There may be seasons where it's worse and seasons where it gets better. Uh, but it is a debilitating disease because it continues to get worse. Uh, usually, the patients will develop unilateral vision, vision loss on one side. Um, they may have uh, sporadic complications with sensory or motor function, depending upon where the lesions are actually forming. Um, they may have um, loss of respiratory control or cardiac centers or you know, bladder control, all these types of things that are autonomic as this lesion moves distally. Okay. The next one um, that I want to talk. Oh yes, question. No, we don't understand why the prevalence uh, tends to kind of not favor females. That's probably the poor word, but um, and but so we don't know. We don't know why females are more susceptible to it. The other thing that we don't understand is this environmental versus genetic um, predisposition. Okay, so there's definitely a genetic component. Um, where people are kind of predisposed to actually developing MS. Uh, but there, tends to, there's, there appears to be an environmental contribution, uh, some environmental, um, um, not predictor, but influencer. And so let me explain. So there's a bunch of studies looking at um, where certain people ethnically come from. Now, this is uh, flawed because where the ethical geographical location arose um, has two components. It has environment and it has um, genetics, right? But what we see is the incident of MS, the incidence of MS in original ethnicities is higher the further away from the equa equator that you get. So um, indigenous people that are closer to the equator that has more sunlight um, have lower incidence of developing MS in our more fair-skinned individuals or ethnicities that are further away, the highest incidence in being like Norwegian descent um, have higher incidence of developing MS. So now the question is, like on the slide, is that genetics because of the ethnicity 
or does that have something to do with sunlight? We don't, we don't know. Okay. So this is a video that I want to play for you all. And um, I want to set this up a little bit. This is an old, old video. You can go to the whole thing. There's the link. It's on my pathology YouTube. This was a, like a VHS tape of a patient interview. Some of you don't know what that is. Um, it, it, it's kind of like these old, uh, monster. They look hilarious when you pull them out now. Um, do you guys know these? Mom and dad have them still? Okay, sweet. All right, so I don't have to explain them. Um, do they still have a VCR to play them? Yeah, awesome. Love it. Me too. I had to buy like an adapter. It was like an HDMI adapter. I had to have like two adapters in series to be able to plug our VCR into our new television. <laughs> but, but like some of our old home, home movies are on VHS. So I was like, I, I guess I got to, you know, spend some money on an adapter. And so on this big, you know, high definition screen, it's super crappy, you know, but you're like, oh, look how cute you look. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, okay, so that's the quality that's here, but this is, it's an interesting story if you watch the whole thing. The whole thing is only eight minutes, and I'm not going to show you the whole thing. I'm going to show you a little segment. And this is my, we might end on this, and we'll have to pick up CTE next, okay? That's okay. Um, so these are two twin brothers at the end of this video, and this is one of the twins. And they start out the video in the beginning, the narrator, um, with, with trying to explain Alzheimer's disease. And, and the thing about Alzheimer's disease that's interesting is it's a dementia. It's the number one dementia that patients wrestle with. It's not the only dementia, um, but it's a severe dementia and some of the risk factors, okay? Some of the risk factors for Alzheimer, which is the next slide. Um, the risk factors are age. So it's a, it's a disease of the age. People don't develop Alzheimer's at your age. They develop it later in life. Prior head trauma is a risk factor. Uh, female gender, again, I don't know, understand why. Um, education level has been identified as a tool or a risk factor where the signs of Alzheimer's might be detected earlier. So let me explain. So this individual that you're going to hear is really bright. He developed Alzheimer's, and his twin brother has not yet. Okay, And we don't understand why, because genetically they're, they're identical twins. But um, in the interview, and in, in, I just want to show you a little segment before we leave. In the interview, you, you can see that the, the, the interviewer is showing pictures of common objects, like a, a brush or a harmonica and saying to, to this patient, tell me what this is. And he's like, oh, he's kind of toying with her like, you know, uh, well, I know what it is. What do you think it is? You know, I mean, he's really kind of an old, cute old man, but he's really bright. He doesn't know. And the more that you watch these, he, he can't remember what it's called. It's really sad to see, but that he, because he's intelligent and has a lot of education, he's able to manipulate the process. And that's what a lot of patients can do with Alzheimer's is they can kind of trick their family into thinking that there's nothing wrong. They're, they're just getting old, and they're forgetful. And it's one of the most difficult diseases, I think, if you ever have experienced it personally or as your patients go through it, because patients will lose their memory. They won't remember their children, their spouse. They won't recall any of the movies on those VHS tapes. They won't remember anything that happened. And it's really sad. They just forget who they are. Okay? So I want you to watch this. I know we're kind of ending on a bummer, but um, I think it underscores Alzheimer's, and we'll pick up with Alzheimer's um, briefly on Monday.
See, he's kind of avoiding the question, right? Okay, so this is where we're going to pick it up um, Monday, is we'll talk about beta amyloid plaques and Alzheimer's, okay? And then we'll get into CTE. I've got another video for you uh, on Monday. All right, have a great weekend. Um, be safe out there. Wear your helmet. <laughs>